Here's the story of my closure dev pure macro so far. It allows us to define a function with exemplary inputs output data. For example, square of zero should be zero, square of two should be four, and square of three should be nine. And those examples are transformed into tests. We can execute those tests and then we can see a problem. The square of three should be nine, but instead it's computed as six. Why is that the case? Because we have a bug in our program. This should not be an addition, it should be a multiplication because that's what squaring means, multiply x by itself. And then all the tests pass. Cool, and I was quite satisfied with this for quite a while, but then I noticed a problem. If instead of generating um, a failed case, we throw an exception, for example, by dividing x by x, you can't divide zero by zero, then we get a very long winded stack trace typical for exceptions in closure land. And the only lines that we're really interested in are the ones stemming from Clopad text, the text file that we're currently editing. So that would be these two lines and then these two lines and then lots of closure stuff in between and then these two lines and then lots of uh, swing stuff in between and uh, my own code here from the IDE. And why is that so bad? We can immediately see the error, but we can't see uh, the test results below that. Uh, do the other tests work or not? So we have to scroll down for that. And we see, no, they fail, not with um, exceptions, just wrong results, right? We get one in both cases because dividing a number, number by itself generally gives one. Okay, and that's quite disruptive for my workflow. So I thought, why should I filter this? myself with my own eyes, the computer can filter that. So I implemented a filter for the stack trace and then it looks like this, only the six interesting lines and we can immediately see the other tests failing and the test results. Okay, and filter stack trace isn't uh, terribly hard to implement. Here we can see the private helper function filter stack trace. It takes a throwable calls get stack trace, then we get an array of stack trace element we for each over that lazily and we only keep an element when the file name of that element equals clopad text. Okay, and as always, for yields a lazy sequence, we have to turn that lazy sequence into an array and then we feed that array to the set stack trace function. And in case, uh, in the unlikely case that you're unfamiliar with the thread last macro, we can macro expand that guy and then you can see the very first argument of that um, macro is fed as the last argument to the next form and then the result of that is fed as the last argument to the next form and so on. Okay, and why do we use an if let here? Well, the filtered may be completely empty and of course a completely empty stack trace wouldn't be um, very helpful. When could that be completely empty? Let's uh, remove the filter temporarily again. So our last uh, clopad entries were here. And below that you only have some closure stuff, some swing stuff, and then uh, clopad implementation itself in between. So if there's a bug in the clopad implementation that happens from time to time, then of course I want to immediately see that. I don't want to see an empty stack trace, but hopefully that doesn't occur too often. Um, on your computers.